Always a thoroughly prepared team, noted for their attention to detail, the Minnesota Vikings were far-sighted enough to bring their own weather to the NFC playoff game. The chemistry was simple enough. H2O doused the Rams fire, for the all-pervasive downpour could not have been more damaging to the Rams' style of play. Aqueous slime had the players moving like ponderous leviathans, sliding and slogging in primeval ooze. The cleverly camouflaged Vikings, who would be at home playing in quicksand, squirted to a 14 to nothing lead. Then, as one of those gloomy Scottish poets might say, in the misty gloaming, the Rams closed with a gallant rush. But alas, they fell full seven short to retreat in defeat from a field of mush. So while the year ended in dark despair, it also ended in direct opposition to a season that for the most part glimmered in sunlight. In 77, Rams fans were promised a rose garden. And game time was a grand scale delight of pomp and pageantry. Piece was a football team in quest of a fifth straight division title. A team whose explosive excitement would produce a ton of fireworks for the fifth. Don Klosterman, owner Carol Rosenblum, and son Steve gathered in Atlanta for the opener, and their eyes were on their new starting quarterback. But the Rams' Georgia debut was far from peachy, and despite moments of diamond purity, the day ended in a clear cut glass defeat, 17 to six. Next, the home opener, and the defense stormed over the Eagles. Thunderclaps by number 90, Larry Brooks, led to easy pickings in the Los Angeles secondary by cornerback Monty Jackson. The fast warming offense popped off some cherry bombs as the Rams blanked the Eagles 20 to nothing. Against San Francisco, defensive end Fred Dreyer ran the 49er line through a paper shredder. And the rest of the Rams' defense then turned the shreds into confetti. As most opponents found out, playing the Rams was like being at San Juan Capistrano when the Swallows return. A lot of bells get rung. Thanks largely to four short touchdowns, and alert efforts like this one by rookie linebacker Bob Brzezinski, the blue and gold notch victory number two, 34 to 14. But while the team was together in spirit and emotion, execution had not yet reached full potential. In the season's fourth week, 
the Bears opened wide and gobbled up the Rams. Namath's passing was inconsistent, and the Bears were scoring on plays that started and ended in different counties. The 24 to 23 Los Angeles loss was noteworthy because Pat Hayden replaced Namath and almost staged a victory rally. It was a portent of things to come. After 13 glory-tinged years, the multifaceted career of Joe Namath had reached the turning point. The wrist rocket passes were still there, but the legs had given up their last remnants of athletic serviceability. Without mobility, Joe had become a well-worn buffer zone between hard-charging linemen and the fast-rising ground. The getting up was slow, and the introspection that followed was as lonely and bittersweet as a haunting love song. Father Time was making a call. Once flowing sands reduced to a trickle, the time had come to doff the war bonnet, fluff the hair, and look for new worlds to conquer. Hooray for Hollywood. And hooray for Pat Hayden. How did Joe take it? Like the gracious competitor he always was. Now with Hayden's quickness and mobility, a new dimension was added to the Los Angeles arsenal. So Namath preached, Hayden practiced, and in week five, the New Orleans Saints paid as Pat's first start of the year became a 14-7 victory. One of Hayden's favorite targets against the Saints was tight end Terry Nelson, a fourth-year man whose abilities in all phases of the game have improved steadily. In only his first season as a full-time starter, Nelson has blossomed into a sure-handed pass catcher. Even in the slippery NFC playoff game, Terry proved to be a glue-fingered mudder, rugged and tough to bring down. Whether it was Pat Hayden or backup Vince Ferragamo throwing the ball, Terry Nelson would take it as far as it could go. While Nelson was a bull, wide receiver Ron Jesse was a greyhound. Unfortunately, Ron was lost early in the season, but the sting was lessened when rookie Billy Waddy, number 80, came on like a streak of lightning. And speaking of lightning, Harold Jackson, number 29, had his best year as a Ram, catching 48 passes. While the quantity was great, the quality was even better. Now, in the same way that Hasty Harrell outran his coverage, the Rams were getting ready to outdistance the rest of the NFC West. Week 6, Monday, on national TV, the Vikings ran into things that went bump in the night. Things like defensive end Jack Youngblood, number 85. Things like cornerback Pat Thomas, number 27, who came up with two thefts while filling in for the injured Rod Perry. And then the offense went to work, and it was head for the hills, Ma, because the dam just broke.
Rookie Wendell Tyler, number 26, streaked 44 yards. And out there in TV land, people watched in admiration as the Rams continued to pressure, continued to score, and rolled up a perfectly executed 35-3 win, which brought their overall record to 4-2. and two. While both offense and defense had sparkled on this star-studded night, a great deal of credit had to go to the Rams' special teams. Return man Billy Waddy could swivel and squirm to a packed field, or he could give it one of those uh-oh moves and then streak quickly out of harm's way. Freeman Johns, Jackie Slater, Rick Newsom, Dwight Scales, Cullen Bryant, Rod Phillips, Winston Hill, Al Cowlings, Charlie Young, and Jackie Wallace were all valuable bomb squatters. Holder Nolan Cromwell helped place kicker Raphael Septien rack up 86 points to finish third in the NFL in scoring. Invaluable contributions by men such as punter Glenn Walker, Kevin McLean, Greg Horton, Jim Jodak, and Bob Pifferini typified the spirit which enabled the Rams to lead the NFL in punt return coverage. The title drive encountered nothing but smooth sailing when the Buccaneers came west. Number 76, Cody Jones, and number 79, Mike Fanning, gave Tampa's quarterback three choices. He could eat the ball, cough it up, or throw it away. All three options were given lengthy tryouts with throwing it away proving the most popular. Linebacker Jim Youngblood, number 53, took his in for six, and Tampa Bay coach John McKay was not loving his homecoming. The Rams rolled up 31 points while keeping the Bucks off the scoreboard. But the real story of the day was running back Lawrence McCutcheon. Number 30 chalked up his 5,000th career yard. Only Dick Bass, with 5,417, had gained more yards as a Ram than McCutcheon. Now, Lawrence was closing in on a Los Angeles legend, for old number 22 had provided Rams fans with many a thrilling memory during the record-making years 1960 to 1969. But now, after only five years, it was Lawrence McCutcheon's turn to enter the record book. And he did it the hard way with a 145-yard day in a 23-7 victory over one of the toughest defenses in the NFL, that of the Atlanta Falcons. KMPC's Dick Enberg described the way it happened. Gives to McCutcheon, trying to go to the right. Has a block at the 40, 45, 50. He's to the 48-yard line, and that's going to do it. That's the run. Lawrence McCutcheon is now the outstanding rusher in Ram history. He has just broken the record of Dick Bass. And now the announcement by John Ramsey. Of the leading all-time Ram rusher ahead of Dick Bass. Dick and Bass is on the sideline. The ball to Lawrence McCutcheon, and Dick Bass is congratulating McCutcheon. Lawrence McCutcheon, you just did it. I'm glad to see you do it. Just keep on doing it, because you're an excellent football player, and I'm proud for you to break everything I got. Thank you, Dick. All right, Take thank the you. Take ball on that. All right, I got it. I won't fumble it. Okay, uh -huh. Lawrence So McCutcheon, McCutcheon gives the ball to Dick Bass. Hey, that's a very warm exchange. Before the year was over, Lawrence of Los Angeles held four new Ram records including most yards in a season with 1,238. Along the way, a lot of appreciated blocks were thrown by men like tackle John Williams, the man in the iron mask, by guard Dennis Hara, whose teammates call him Hercules, by center Rich Saul, the complete craftsman, 
by a moving mountain named Doug France at left tackle, and by wily veteran guard Tom Mack. In the season's ninth week in Green Bay, the offense took it easy because the defense was awesome. Safety Dave Elmendorf, number 42, showed Medal of Honor courage by playing with a badly broken rib. His alertness was infectious, and the Rams rolled to their sixth win, 24-6. It was a win filled with inspirational moments, such as linebacker Carl Eckern's one-man goal line stand, which seemed to give Fred Dreyer a slight case of Sunday afternoon fever. Enthusiasm and emotion were Rams' trademarks in 77, especially for the linebacker core, where number 58, Isaiah Robertson, relished the heavy hitting. Number 64, Jack Reynolds, is called Hacksaw, but plays with the stunning subtlety of a 20-pound sledgehammer. Jim Youngblood, number 53, was a full-scale disruptive influence to everyone's offense. The main thing about the Rams' defenders was their strong sense of camaraderie. If they were a cavalry platoon in the Old West, their story would read, these lusty heroes lived, laughed, and fought together, and with their boots on, they rode out and bit the dust together. Sometimes the defense stuck alone. Sometimes they stuck in pairs. But mostly they stuck together in great heavy swarms of blue and gold. The season's 10th week found the Rams in San Francisco, where the 49ers were overmatched by the magic moves of Billy Waddy and Lawrence McCutcheon, who was off on yet another 100-yard day. Jim Plunkett's leading receiver was Los Angeles free safety, Bill Simpson, number 48. Simpson came up with three thefts, a passable imitation of Gale Sayers, and 95 yards in returns, which was a good trot down the road to a 23-10 win. were now in the middle of a six-game victory streak. The fourth victim was Cleveland. Frigid temperatures could not cool the Torrid Ram defense, which was on its way to a club season record of three shutouts. This 9-0 win under adverse conditions showcased the Rams' abundance of enthusiasm, talent, and depth. These were the qualities which now left the blue and gold only one big win away from their fifth division crown. These are the already proven qualities that will be harnessed to the new leadership next season. In 1978, George Allen will return as head coach of the Los Angeles Rams. He brings an attitude geared to success and an abiding enthusiasm for the game. I like enthusiastic people. I think that if, if you're enthusiastic and excited about what we have, I want everybody in the Ram organization, especially our players and coaches and trainers and equipment men, to be excited about the opportunity we have. The goal that we're all seeking is the Super Bowl. 
and this applies in any organization, is to get everybody pulling at the same end of the rope to help the organization win. Everybody sticking together, working hard. That's the top priority. When you have that, then all things are possible. In the season's 12th week, the Rams proved that all things were possible. When before a star-studded Coliseum crowd, they went up against the then world champion Oakland Raiders. It was like a homecoming. Ex-Ram greats caused the mind to recall past glories, times when giant killers and fearsome foursomes roamed the Coliseum turf, feeding on the shattered dreams of enemy quarterbacks. Who could ever forget the Deacon? He made a religion of reducing quarterbacks to sackcloth and ashes. Who could forget Marilyn Olson, number 74, racing out to all pro honor and fame for 14 straight seasons? And big Roger Brown, another all pro of great renown who took over Rosie Greer's position. And who can forget Lamar Lundy, a man whose courage on the field has lasted to become the courage of a lifetime. Ah, those were the days, my friend. But help from ghosts of seasons past was not needed because this year's front four ranks among the best. All pro and Jack Youngblood gets plenty of support from steadily improving tackle Cody Jones, number 76. Larry Brooks is one of the finest defensive tackles in the game. And of course, flamboyant Fred Dreyer, whose quickness added yet another dimension as the Rams' defense ripped through the Raider line and cut Ken Stabler down an inch at a time. The Raiders were in the hole early, and the Rams' squeeze got tighter and tighter. The world champions had nowhere to run and nowhere to throw. Four times the Rams intercepted Stabler. This alert theft being picked off by Dave Elmendorf. When the offense took over, they powered relentlessly toward the end zone. John Capaletti came in on a fourth and goal situation. It might have been the inspiration. It definitely was a guts touchdown. But the Raiders cannot be stopped forever and late in the last quarter, they took the lead 14 to 13. A perfect time for any team to fold, but the Rams players and fans never gave it a thought. It was just time for character to surface and the biggest firecracker of the year had to be launched. Rams 20, Raiders 14. With a 10 and four record, and for the fifth straight year, the Los Angeles Rams were the champions of the NFC West. While division championships are nice, the goals for 1978 are loftier. And as the man said, with hard work, all things are possible.